Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce John Bowditch and Steve Mokris. Uh, John and Steve from the Grid Lab are pre presenting on advances in digital photogrammetry and how it can be applied to game development and computer graphics. Uh, the Game Research and Immersive Design Lab, an initiative of Ohio University Scripps College of Communications, was developed by college staff and faculty to provide the Appalachian Ohio region with training, education, and opportunity to develop technical and creative skills through the use of interactive digital game technology. Welcome. Thank you. I'm John Bowditch, uh, director of the Grid Lab. I'm Steve Mokris, uh, technical director of the Grid Lab. Um, and today we're going to be talking um, about technology that we're using on one of our current research projects. Um, and we're going to be giving some demonstrations. Uh, we, we really don't like formal presentations, so if you have any questions, just raise your hand or shout at us or something. Yeah. We'll do it in a minute. Just as he gets okay. Going, yes. Yeah. When we switch to his, that'll be fun. Um, so we're just going to give you a quick overview of uh, the Grid Lab and our mission. Uh, discuss some of the research problems um, that we came across um, looking at our current project. Discuss the historical use of photogrammetry. Um, it's actually a technique that's um, that was really invented in the 15th century. Um, but with advances in computing technology, um, it's becoming widely used um, in the digital realm. Uh, Steve is going to actually demo some of our immersive cameras that we've brought. Um, and we're going to give a quick tutorial of the different software we use and how it fits into our game development pipeline. Um, so the GRID Lab, GRID stands for Game Research and Immersive Design Lab. Uh, we're just entering our fourth year. Um, as part of the Scripps College of Communication at Ohio University. Um, we, are, uh, we are our own department, so we, we actually um, serve five schools within our college, um, primarily the School of Media Arts and Studies and the School of Visual Communication. Uh, we have a um, digital media degree in the School of Media Arts and Studies, um, and that focuses on game development, uh, computer animation, and special effects for film and video. We have some of our students here. Um, so, our research problem. Um, we were approached by the Columbus, Ohio Police Department, um, specifically their um, Homeland, Homeland Security um, Division, to look at a way to model the city of Columbus. Um, we, our first thoughts were, well, we'll just, you know, go to our strengths and do 3D modeling. Um, but doing that for 60 structures, mostly skyscrapers um, in the uh, Columbus, Ohio area, um, wasn't really feasible. Um, so we started looking, I mean, the, the biggest problems were we had many models to do, many locations and many settings. Um, I mean, if you just look around this room, if you've ever done computer, computer modeling before, um, you know that like even just this room would be a huge challenge. Um, so. Uh, we, got a, we got a contract um, to work with them. Um, uh, the first contract is a 24-month contract. We're about six months into that now, um, which will conclude in 2010. Um, and what we're doing is we're using photogrammetry tools to rapidly produce models um, for a web-delivered simulation. Um, and <laughs> we're going to go over some of the technology we're using um, to make that possible. Um, but uh, Steve and I are pretty experimental when it comes to research, and we don't really like to just do contract production work, so we like to try out new technologies, new techniques. Um, and it didn't take us long to find a you know, relatively new field in computer science called photogrammetry. Um, okay, so uh, what is photogrammetry? Um, from our, from our uh, point of view, as, you know, as far as like uh, using technology to capture visual images, photogrammetry really got its start around the uh, beginning of um, uh, photography itself, so um, mid-1800s. Um, and it was primarily used at the time for topography and cartography purposes. Um, so essentially, uh, 
um, it uses the process of triangulation, right? So we would have um, more than one camera, generally two or three shots um, are a minimum. Um, and basically what we're trying to do is just get a different, we're trying to get multiple perspectives on a three-dimensional object, right? Um, we can actually use photogrammetry to extract 3D models from just one image, although it's very hard, um, and it's really hard to get a concept of depth. Since, since there's no depth information. Yeah, um, so I mean, to generate that I mean if, if you're extracting a model from a, a 2D image that is um, common to you, right, if, if it's an iMac, you, you know how thick an iMac is, um, that might be okay, because you can guess that information. Um, but really, I mean, the roots, date back all the way to the 15th century. You have um, several Renaissance painters um, that discovered the, the power of perspective, um, including Leonardo da Vinci and uh, one of my favorites, uh, Vermeer. Um, and so they basically understood the, line, uh, the concepts of the line of sight and were able to uh, determine perspective um, and make it look like it's three-dimensional on a flat surface. So, um, you know, for most of the 20th century, it was still a non-digital uh, craft, primarily still used for topography and cartography. Um, but with computers becoming much smarter um, and much more user-friendly, um, there's a lot of mainstream tools out there, um, but the process is still not mainstream. Um, and basically because of price. Would you say that's accurate? Um, and we'll go over some of the barriers to entry in this field. Um, so here's an example of um, perspective. Steve, do you want to explain this? Um, go ahead. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> well, uh, this is actually a, a painting from the late 19th century. Um, and so maybe if I can walk over here. Can you hear me if I just talk like this? Uh, so you, you see here, uh, this is actually probably the best image. Um, you have uh, lines drawn. You all did this probably in like an early art class, even like in high school, right? Um, where you're, you can actually see where a camera might be here or down there, and you're able to interpret what a three-dimensional object would look like, even though that's flat, right? So that's what we're basically telling the computer to do to help us with. Um, so we get to photo, uh, digital photogrammetry. Um, this is actually a shot from um, one of the oldest buildings um, at our university, actually the oldest building at our university um, called Cutler Hall. Um, and this is actually made up of just two images, uh, two scans. And we're going to go over that more in detail. I just wanted to kind of give you um, an idea of where we're going with this. Um, so the left image is a wireframe image and the right side is a textured um, model. So Steve's going to talk a little bit about uh, our two types of immersive cameras um, and some of the barriers that come with each. Okay. So, um, yeah, uh, on the left here is the Panoscan Mark III. Um, this is a uh, boutique item, uh, the sort of item you'd need to take out a second mortgage to purchase. Um, <laughs> Uh, this thing, um, it's basically a, uh, like a flatbed scanner. Um, it, it has a single row of CCD pixels to uh, detect the image. Um, and this thing, uh, on the base there is a motor which rotates it around 360 degrees. Um, the lens is a 22.5 uh, millimeter fisheye lens which uh, gets slightly above uh, 180 degrees. Uh, in the vertical direction. So we squeeze 180 degrees into the vertical strip and then get vertical strips rotating around in a circle. Um, so uh, initially we, we started out with, with these uh, funded by the grant. Um, we have that one uh, right there in the center um, and I'll, I'll show you a demo of that in a minute. Um, and uh, some drawbacks to this were obviously the, the expense. Um, additionally, um, it's uh, it needs to be very stable in order for it to uh, scan without um, the lines jumping up and down. Um, so we've had some stability issues uh, with that. Um, it, it takes a long time to do a high resolution scan since it is only scanning one line at a time. And uh, depending on the shutter speed, um, you, you might get between 60 and 100 lines per second. So it takes 
several minutes to rotate around the room. Um, so we were looking for less expensive, more portable, uh, user-friendly alternatives. And uh, we noticed that the Canon uh, has a nice SLR camera. And uh, we discovered that um, by uh, using a, an extreme fisheye lens for this one that can get us a 180 by 180 photograph, um, we, we can then uh, mount this camera on an, a mount kind of similar to the rotating one, but one that we manually rotate. And uh, the mount uh, uh, has notches in it, so we can rotate it at preset intervals. Um, then we can take a series of snapshots, and uh, using um, the open source project uh, Hugin, uh, we can stitch those together into an image very similar to what the Panascan creates uh, for, and uh, the digital SLR kit, including lens uh, and a really nice tripod for it, uh, comes in under $2,000. Yeah, um, which is about a 20th the cost of the other one. So, I mean, the, but there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to both, and we're, we're going to go over that. Yeah. Um, so, um, Steve's going to do a Panascan demo first. Um, since it's kind of a small crowd, and if you'd like to get closer, um, please do so. Uh, if you have questions afterwards or you want to come up and see it, uh, I can demo it after the presentation. Uh, Did not see it? Uh, one of these is an input and one is an output. Oh. <laughs> plug them both into the input. Well, why he's setting that up, just some more information about the camera. Uh, this particular lens is 22.5 uh, millimeters. Um, and we're actually going to do about a 380 degree scan. It's, it's better to overscan, um, so you can line it up later. And since it overscans vertically, um, we actually need to match up the floor and the ceiling. Because um, it will pick up even the tripod in the scan. Um, if, it's really designed for the ca uh, camera operator to be down at the base um, there's like a little plate for the MacBook, um, but even that person will be, will be picked up in the scan. So it's 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 a little too too much. It's in some some ways. All right. Okay. Um, so prior to uh, starting, we did a test scan. Um, I'll I'll go ahead and uh, initiate um, a new scan here. So uh, yeah, the uh, better light is the manufacturer of the uh, CCD array in the camera device here, and then um, it's resold by um, another company that integrates the CCD array into the whole motorized apparatus. Um, so uh, yeah, let's do a full scan here. This says it will take three minutes, 21 seconds. Um, and we can, we can use a light meter to, to gauge the amount of light to set the lens. Um, the lens is manual, um, but what we really just do is do a pre-scan in a room. In this case, these settings only take 25 seconds, so we can determine really quickly um, how the image looks. We could also make modifications, and it'll simulate what it will look like um, if, we, if we change the ISO or the yes. um, uh, line time. So when it gets close to you, be very still. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but you can have a lot of like fun artistically with it. Steve and I were doing some early tests where we wanted to play with removing multiple people from an image. Um, and it was just he and he and I. And so uh, we would start the camera, we'd let it scan us, then we'd run around the opposite direction and get back in the shot um, and you know, pose differently. Um, and so we ended up getting the shot, what, four or five times, just At least. through some hustle. Yep. <laughs> um, and, 
you can see the uh, vertical bar going across the screen there. Um, it's not actually updating the scan on the screen. Uh, that's actually the pre-scanned image that I took before this presentation started, so you're not actually seeing yourself scanned in real time. A deficiency in the software we're working with the vendor to correct, hopefully. <laughs> Do you want to talk about uh, file size with these yeah, uh, um, pixel resolution? So at, at, right now, um, we're operating at a 50% resolution. Um, if we crank that up to 100, uh, it'll take roughly uh, double the amount of time or quadruple. I don't remember exactly how that scales. But, um, and uh, adjusting the line time, the uh, shutter speed for every vertical segment uh, also affects the scan time. So um, we've had some scans that have taken up to 20 minutes or so yeah. if we're doing a, a dark room at full resolution. Um, when we do a full resolution scan, uh, I, the output um, ends up being uh, around like 8,000 pixels by 4,000, I think. Yeah. Um, and uh, this, uh, the CCD array in this camera uh, scans <laughs> at more than 8 bits per channel. So uh, I, I think it get, does 14 bits per channel. Uh, so when that's encoded in TIFF format, uh, the, like a, a single scan uh, consumes about 1.5 gigabytes of storage. Um, so it's huge, right? And the final output of this is a web-delivered 3D game. So obviously, um, in a room this size, we would probably end up doing probably between six and 10 scans yeah. um, to get the perspective that we needed. Right, so just to do this room, if the textures are, you know, over 15 gigs, that's not going to be very web ready. Um. Okay, we are almost done here. So this scan is actually a TIFF file. Right? It's not a raw file. Um, and it's compressed to about 52 megabytes. That's still not very web ready. Uh, and we'll show how we actually get that down um, to a 3D textured model um, under a megabyte. That is still intelligible, <laughs> uh, oddly enough. Uh, the scanner is rewinding. Cool. And we will save this to the desktop. And you um, can use multiple lenses on that camera. You yeah. can, um, anything that's not fisheye will become like a, will almost look like, a, it'll look like a cylinder. Right, so um, if you wanted to do mountainside scans, um, or um, like if you're down in a valley and you wanted to scan around it, you could use a telephoto lens, um, but you're not going to get top and bottom. It's a little dark in here. Yeah. Um, and we actually have a light rig that sits right Below, uh, right above where the motor is, um, and will light with the camera as it moves around. Um, so uh, this is at full resolution here. Um, we can see pretty huge amounts of detail. That's what happens if you move. Whoa. <laughs> um, for our purposes, since we care more about the structure um, than the, the people that would be in the shot, um, even like the chairs, since these chairs um, most likely aren't always configured like this, we would probably end up removing them. Um, either we'd create a texture that erased the floor. Whoa, go back and, <laughs> uh, you know, or just, just made a, a constant texture across the floor. Um, it's much easier for us to build a mesh of a chair and place them wherever we want um, and let the, wow, <laughs> uh, let the person drive in the simulation determine um, how, how to interact with them. Um, you also notice some vertical stripes. Um, it's one of the challenges we're still uh, working out. Um, whenever there's a, there's a point light or direct, directional light, you, you generally get like a streak. Um, and so we're working on methods to reduce that. Um, we, uh, Actually, two of these three students up here uh, work on the Ivan project. That's what this project's called. And um, in a typical eight-hour work shift with two camera rigs, we can do about 200 scans in a facility, um, which is about two and a half minutes per scan. 
So we move quickly. We don't want to go back and have to touch up a lot of images. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, this is our uh, base image here. Um, let's see. The resolution. Um, yeah, this, this is uh, about half resolution. So um, 3,000 by 6,052. Or, so actually, it does 12,000 horizontally at full resolution. Um, I will save the uh, brighter version. And um, now we can, um, it, one, one quick way to preview this uh, is um, as a QuickTime VR movie. So uh, we can export that. Um, and uh, someone who downloads that can, or within a web browser, can navigate um, inside of it and, and uh, scan around. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate how to do that in a minute. Um, first of all, uh, I mentioned earlier that the lens we're using gets slightly above 180 degrees in the vertical direction. So we need to correct for that because we want an equal rectangular image, um, one that it scans an entire 360 degrees uh, along the, uh, um, the horizon, the yaw movement, um, and 180 degrees from top to bottom uh, in the pitch direction. Um, so. Uh, since we have, we have slightly more than 180 degrees vertically and slightly more than 360 degrees uh, horizontally, um, so we need to then crop this. So um, we got this little utility here. Yeah, and surprisingly, uh, the Panascan rigs right now only run on uh, Apple computers, um, even though I think most of the software, with the exception of the proprietary stuff that came with the camera, uh, is cross-platform. So um, I, need to, I need to copy something within the server, I just realized. Um, OK, so uh, this, this view here allows us to adjust the horizontal seam. Um, so uh, let's see. I think by reducing the width, yeah. Um, reducing the width, we can get these sections to align. Um, that's a little closer, and then we can zoom in. Um, it's easiest to see where the edge is at the um, edge of this, uh, the chandeliers from the ceiling here. Um, so make that a little smaller and try to get that line. That's too small. Uh, that's not bad. Uh, does that line up all the way across the image? Yeah, generally, we set up the camera to scan first on a, a straight line or a corner where we can match it up easily. Yeah. Um, OK, that looks good. Then uh, now we can crop the left or the, the top and the bottom. Um, we are, um, so let's see, this, this is kind of, um, in order to calibrate this properly, you, you'd want to have uh, more or less a, a grid set up um, both above and below the camera. So uh, some uh, fancy hotel carpet pattern works pretty well. This one's a little too fancy. Um, and like the typical like office lighting ceilings where you have the like uh, four foot by two foot uh, tiles. Um, then you can tell w what is a straight line and what is curved. So we notice um, up here, this is a little curved and this is a lot of curved. Um, so we're going to uh, reduce the height a bit to compensate for that. Um, that looks a little better. Um, and on the bottom here, uh, yeah, the, the carpet is still coming in at not quite the same angle. Um, that's a little better, I think. Um, yeah, we'll go with that for now. Uh, radial color correction, lens distortion correction, 22 millimeter, equal rectangular, map horizontally, don't create a movie. Okay, export. Um, uh, where are we? Not a con. And one of the neat things, since in, in production, we would scan this room multiple times in a series of lines. We'd basically kind of create a grid and go across that. Um, you could kind of see in the bottom, you, could, you saw like a, a disk shape. That was the camera picked up. Um, if we do multiple scans and we overlay them, they actually will move out the camera. We'd only have to remove the camera once in the entire room. Um, so it's pretty handy. Yeah. Um, so this is the cropped image. Um, it doesn't really look much different because we just removed edges on the top and the right and left. Um, okay, now uh, we can take that into Cubic Converter here and build a QuickTime VR movie out of that. Okay, 
uh, echo rectangular, cube faces, uh, convert. So it is now mapping the uh, rectangular, or the echo rectangular spherical capture into a series of cube faces so that when QuickTime VR displays this, um, all it has to do is render a set of um, eight or six sides for uh, six quads for a cube. Um, and now we get a fairly realistic uh, perspective view of the room from here. Um, and unlike previously when uh, I was just scrolling around in the image, uh, we, we actually see it uh, kind of warping around at the edges, uh, which gives us a little more realistic perspective. So we've got that. Um, we can then export this. So yeah, this is a, a QuickTime VR image that can be embedded in the HTML page. Okay, and uh, yeah, here's the QuickTime VR version. Um, and look at that. And yeah, somehow you can, yeah. QuickTime VR is not very exciting. Exciting stuff uh, is what we can do after that. Um, so should I uh, demonstrate the SLR now? Sure, yeah. Okay. I think we have time. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's just one possible output of this, a QuickTime VR. Yeah. Um, we're going to show another solution here. Okay, so um, yeah, that took a while. Uh, but what we ended up with at the end was a, uh, a, a single echo rectangular image. Um, what we're going to do here is take this camera, um, an SLR with the 180 degree fisheye, and uh, let's see, this needs to not go on like that. Okay. Um, maybe we can kind of, this isn't going to be very precise. Okay, so um, yeah, the, the camera rotates around here. Um, we've got the focal point roughly um, at the center so that um, we don't experience parallax error. Um, and then it snaps into position at six locations around the 360 degrees. So uh, turn on the camera. I'll stand right here and take a series of photos. Uh, how do you use this camera? Okay. This is kind of a upper end consumer camera that you could pick up um, anywhere. I think we got these off of Amazon. Yeah, it was $400 or so. Um, so, yeah, that's all we need to do there. Uh, the advantage of this is uh, we don't have a laptop hooked up. We don't have that whole gigantic camera that gets all tangled up. Um, very easy, portable. When you're on the road, you can take this with you. It takes no space whatsoever, and you can quickly shoot a couple shots, pack up, leave. Um, so great for those situations. Uh, however, once, you're, once you've shot the photographs, it requires a bit more post-production work because you, then you need to stitch together all of those images. So. Um, I will connect this here, download the images, and give a quick demo of using Hugen to, Hugen to uh, stitch these together. And Hugen's free cross-platform. And it is Hugen. Steve found a YouTube video like three quarters of the way through where they said it in Swedish. <laughs> uh, this should be downloading the photos, maybe. Sure. Uh, it's we had to license it, um, and I'm pretty sure it's proprietary. Yeah, that, that to is the proprietary camera. software. Um, um, there there are open source equivalents. I I don't remember offhand what they are though, but we can look that up. Yeah, and I mean you could use VR Works, um, which is a pretty. It's it's kind of an old product now, but um, it's a few hundred dollars, I think. Okay, so this is what the, uh, shoot, uh, exposure, exposure, that's a little um, Okay, that looks decent. Uh, yeah, here's what the room looks like, um, what, one, one photograph. 
So um, a lot of the CCD space is wasted here, so we're looking at ways to uh, increase the amount, or the uh, projection space taken up on the CCD. Um, we've tried using uh, like macro lens extenders, but haven't had very much success with that yet. Um, so uh, we're open to suggestions. Um, so we've got six of these images here, um, and uh, now we can take them into Hugin and stitch them. So yeah, this program is free open source. Uh, desktop, Let's see, okay. Um, so uh, we're gonna pick these six images. Um, the lens is cylindrical panoramic, focal length 4.5 millimeters. No, just 4.5 millimeters. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, it's, yeah, try that uh, middle one. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's a circular for trying, yeah. my, my bad. Um, 4.5. Yeah, that works better. Uh, focal length multiplier 1.41. Um, okay, now, actually, uh, before we do that, um, the, there, there was a lot of black space um, in, on the edges. Uh, we need to eliminate that black space and um, make it alpha transparent. So uh, I've prepared a little uh, application here that will let us do that if Fiber cooperates. Uh, So it's obviously a lot cheaper to use this solution, but there's a lot more prep per 360 degree scan. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when, once you've uh, shot the images, then you you can run them through this little uh, app that I wrote here. That uh, it crops them down and it adds uh, an alpha mask to the image um, and converts it to a, a PNG file. So um, then we can um, feed the alpha transparent images. Uh, so. In, into Hugin, and uh, it will properly deal with the uh, transparent areas. Why is this so slow? Two kilobytes? <laughs> Serious? Do you want to uh, do you want to switch projectors? If we can go into sure. yeah, let's uh, come back photogrammetry real quick, and then come back to that. It's probably going to take the rest of that night to download 1.5 megabytes. Okay, so for photogrammetry, uh, we use um, a software application that wasn't really developed by Autodesk, but is now owned by Autodesk called Image Modeler. Um, used to be Virtuals, which was owned by a company, Virtuals. Um, so we have a video of this. This is kind of a time consuming process that so we kind of um, consolidated a little bit. So essentially, this is a, this is a room from Ohio University. We have four scans within that room represented at the bottom. Um, and those blue dots with the text are essentially locator nodes. Um, uh, what we do is we will usually look for corners or doors that are, that are square. We know the dimensions of them um, and that show up in every camera shot. Um, so we will place points in the corner in each camera's perspective and the computers will process how to match those up. Um, uh, in this case, we're just building a cube that will represent um, the dimensions of the chair. Um, and here it is in just a bland shader. So this is a process of creating a mesh from this. The nice thing is, um, we can export this model as one model, take the four, four scans, export it as one model with one texture file. It lays out the UV uh, images together for us, which is very difficult to do um, if you model from scratch. Just very time consuming. So this is a image modeler up until about two months ago was Windows only. This is actually on the Mac version, which was just came out. Um, unfortunately, there's no educational license, so right now this software runs for about $1,000 a license. 
Um, but it's pretty intuitive and it's really simple to learn. Okay, so you know, from here, uh, you, can, you can actually export this to several different modeling applications, uh, all of them PolySoup. Um, we use Maya, that's what we teach in our classes. And so from this, this is actually a mesh that was created from a single scan uh, in a room in that same building. Um, so from one two-dimensional image, we were able to gather this much data and build a three-dimensional wireframe. So this is it as a wireframe um, with just a s simple Lambert shader and then with the textures applied. All right, so we're outside it right now. That's why the uh, insides are, you can look through the walls. Um, but if you get down in the space, uh, you can see all the different sides. Now this, this image is really still rough and we wouldn't ship it like this. Uh, we would go through and we would remove uh, the camera tripod and any different artifacts um, or chairs that bleed into the carpet texture that we want to get rid of. Um, and it's, that's, that's very simple. We just take this um, uh, UV mapped image into Photoshop and touch it up however we need to. Um, so um, from the time of scan to when we have it complete, it's about a 60 to 75 minute process per image, um, which is pretty time consuming because Steve and I have other projects going on. So thankfully we have about 20 students on the project that help out and do a lot of the more artistic work um, and just help process the image and, and do the models. Um, so it's, uh, it's really good portfolio material for them, um, for the undergraduates, and it's good research material material for our grad students. Um, unfortunately, most of the structures we're doing in Columbus are classified areas, so we can't let them use them in their portfolios when they're done. Um, so we're looking for um, just kind of unique spaces um, that we can scan for practice and for portfolio purposes. So we've done two buildings now, uh, Cutler Hall, um, which is, turns 200 years old and I think about five or six years. Um, and we did a new medical facility in Chillicothe that's a very modern um, building with lots of glass and lots of reflective surfaces. So that was another challenge in itself. Do you have that set up, Steve? Yeah, this is ready. Um, okay, so going back to the uh, uh, images from the digital SLR, uh, we now have this uh, masking program down here. Uh, if the display comes on. Um, okay, so we've got these six uh, masked images. Um, I'll open up one of these. So the original image is here. Um, we've got all this black area, um, and then the masked area, um, it's showing transparent as gray right now. Um, I can adjust that. So um, uh, the, the black areas are transparent, and then we, we have a sort of uh, gradient that goes in toward the center here. Um, we noticed that uh, with this particular, with, with the lens that we're using on this camera, um, when, when we get to, toward the very edges, uh, we notice significant color, like chromatic aberrations, uh, color shifts going on, and uh, it loses focus. So by uh, increasing the alpha transparency um, of the image, we can tell Hugin that uh, that part of the image is not important, and it places a lower weight on it when calculating. Uh, which parts of the image to include in the composite image. So um, we go back into Hugin. Uh, I will not load those images. I'll make a new thing here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, hey, it's open source. <laughs> it's still under development. Um, load images. Uh, so we'll load the six masked images. Circular fisheye. Uh, focal length 4.5, 1.41, no, 2.16 roughly uh, gives us about 180 degrees horizontal field of vision. Uh, I have to do that again. 2.16. Okay. Um, 
we've got that loaded. Uh, now, um, uh, Hugin uh, comes with a, or, uh, comes bundled with a separate application uh, called AutoPano, which uh, will automatically an analyze uh, the set of images that you send into it, find uh, distinct points on the images, and attempt to match these points uh, across the different images. So uh, now we'll run through the, the alignment process. So um, it starts by uh, looking at each image. It, it scales it down uh, to a more reasonable resolution. Uh, it didn't find any key points in that image. That's bad. Uh, why is it not finding key points? Okay. Um, well, we can uh, do this live. Um, okay. Uh, if, if the uh, automatic feature extraction doesn't work, uh, I, I think it's probably a configuration error. I, I just set the software up on this laptop last night or this morning or sometime. Um, so we, we can pick uh, points on here that are common, that are seen in both images. So uh, we're looking at, uh, on, okay, my, the laptop is visible in both images, uh, though not very visible on the screen. Um, we can pick an edge of the laptop, pick an edge of the laptop over on this image and tell it to correlate those two. Uh, then we can do likewise with a few more points. Hmm. So it's the same concept of image modeler, um, just, just a little different. Obviously much cheaper. Uh-huh. Um, you mean the wireframe? Yeah, yeah it, it creates the edges in Image Modeler, but then we just exported it to Maya. Um, it exports to um, Maya and 3D Studio Max because they're both Autodesk products now. Um, you can also export it to Blender um, and some other, I think Cinema 4D, some other applications. Okay. Um. When, when you're doing this for real, you would want to uh, add as many control points as possible. I'm just going to add two per image, which is probably going to look like crap. But it might actually give us a usable image. Add. Uh, one more. This chair right there. Chair. Yeah, so like if, if we were going to do multiple scans in this room, generally we do, um, we kind of imagine like a 10 foot by 10 foot grid. 10 feet's pretty good um, distance. Um, but it really depends on the ceiling height. Um, actually, the, the more wide open the space is, the less scans you have to do. Um, and the panda scan is actually really great for that. Um, so we would maybe start at a door or a place where we can kind of determine as an origin, and then move 10 feet from there. Um, either step it off or use a measuring tape. Um, Usually, the floor either has tiles that are 12 inches, or we can just count ceiling tiles that are four feet by two feet. Um, so, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be too exact because we're going to be moving around um, an image model la later. Um, we just have to, I think coverage is more important than um, you know making sure you get like equal distance apart. Yeah, I mean, uh, multiple images really, um, we do it per room, right? So we, we finish a room in an image modeler, then we export it to Maya, and then in Maya, we actually line up and connect the rooms. Uh, and from there, I mean, we can, w generally what we do is we do about four rooms as one model, um, uh, or, or the equivalent of about 100 feet. Uh, and that's primarily because of uh, drawing distance in our game engine. Uh, the game engine we use is Unity 3D. Um, which up until a month ago was only Mac, um, uh, was only a Mac software piece. Now it's both Mac and Windows. Um, really cool game engine. Uh, it's what we teach in. Um, but the, the neat part about it is we can actually export it as a 3D web-based game um, with all, all it requires is a free plugin from Unity. Um, 
highly suggest you check out Unity um, if you're at all interested in 3D game development. You can also do um, 2D game development in it, um, so kind of like isometric platformers, and iPhone, they have an iPhone plugin so you can export your games to iPhone. Um, these three students are all experiencing Unity this quarter, so they can probably answer some questions as well. Yes? Yeah. Or the um, shadowed surfaces. Th those are more difficult, especially like um, mirrors I th are the worst, obviously, because um, you kind of get like a feedback effect. Um, but I don't know, generally, we're, we're still experimenting with that. One option, like windows, all windows will reflect. Um, so we've been playing with like sky boxes, like just removing the windows altogether and putting a sky box on the outside um, that we walk around the building and just take with uh, regular SLR. Yeah, and, and then you, we can take those multiple images shot with the SLR and use Coogan to uh, automatically stitch them together and produce a sky box for us. Yeah, and another problem is like lining up verts. Like if that camera moves just a hair, the models will not line up correctly. And plus, I mean, if you put a micrometer up to like a laser micrometer up to like any surface, no construction worker is good enough to build like square rooms, like perfect square rooms. So um, we have to fudge that a little bit um, to get it all, to make sure there's no light gaps um, or just holes in the game because that can, that can really dog performance. We could fall through the floor. Is that, do you want to switch back real quick and we'll, I'll just go through the last few slides and then we can bring um, that up. This is done actually. Oh, it's done, okay, good. Okay, so uh, in Hugen I, I placed a bunch of control points. I then uh, ran the auto analyzer that correlated the control points and uh, produced the three-dimensional mappings of where those images should go in 3D space uh, to produce a spherical image and uh, then I stitched them together. So uh, let's see what that looked like. Here's the output. Um, and we'll make that brighter. So six images now stitched together. Very similar to what we did with the Panascan camera. Um, from here we can take it into Image Modeler, do the photogrammetry work, extract a 3D model, and put it into a game engine. Yeah, so... Um, Pretty yeah, decent quality. That, too. that actually didn't turn out too bad for the couple of control points I put. Uh, actually, that, that's not cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, uh, the, the computer does a much better job picking control points than most people. Yeah. Um, so when that works, it's very helpful and it speeds up the process a lot. So you, basically, it's fully automated and uh, within about five minutes of post-processing work, you can get a perfectly stitched final image out from shooting just six photos with a spherical lens. Yeah, so we're still acquiring more camera kits, but the goal is to have two Panascan rigs. We have both of those now. Um, and then six of the digital SLR kits. Um, so eight people scanning at one time. Um, and then have several, um, I guess, uh, just people, like uh, image editors in the field, basically making sure that all six images are, um, th there's no focus issues or anything like that. And we'll start stitching them in the field um, and start uploading them from there. Because um, obviously, um, it, it would be kind of hard to determine how, or which images go with which in the end if you waited, um, especially if you, have, if you have to retake one and uh, remove another. Um, so uh, why this is great for game development? Well, very, very low poly count. Um, that image I brought up in Maya, I think, was only about 50 polys. Um, basically, basically because we're dealing in cubic surfaces. Um, and so, if we scan on the Panascan full resolution uh, raw, the image is 1.5 gigabytes. It's useless, really. Um, and actually, uh, most of the software apps we use crash or won't even accept an image that high. Um, so they're useless. So generally, the, the compressed files we get from the Panascan are about 50 megabytes maybe between 50 and 75 megabytes. Um, when we take them in the image model or export them, export them as Maya models, we get them down under, under one megabyte. Uh, generally, I think 
you know, I think that building we showed with texture was about 200 kilobytes, so it's nothing really um, and, and for game models. Um, so we, we've solved the hurdle of a lot of graphics and a lot of meshes that we need for this project. Um, and part of it is, you know, we have really good software tools. Um, we have a really great game engine, Unity 3D. I highly recommend you check it out. Um, the image quality is improving with uh, further tests, um, new software pieces that we find like Hugin. Hugin was a big find for us, um, especially since it was free. Um, and, you know, game engines are improving. That technology is um, improving. You can do more with it. For example, we can export it to a, three, you know, a 3D game in a web browser um, that looks way better than Second Life, right? So uh, everything looks way better than Second Life. But um, so game engines are, you know, becoming significant. I would imagine that by the end of this project, we'll look at um, porting it to a mobile app um, such as the iPhone or uh, uh, yeah, Android don't. system yeah. or something. Um, do you want to talk about the technology cons? Uh, yeah, I, um, okay. In, in the case of the uh, digital SLR, um, in, initially we just had a, uh, a tripod and we were rotating the tripod around and we discovered that the point around which the camera was rotating was not the same as the focal point of the camera. So what happened is the, the head of the camera is moving uh, and we, uh, we get parallax error. So things that are, when, when you're moving, things that are close by move more than uh, or visually, they move more than when they are far away. Uh, so um, the images thus do not line up. So uh, by um, taking the little adapter that's on the top there, um, the horizontal bar, uh, we can scoot the camera across um, so that uh, to align it exactly to uh, rotate around the focal point of the lens. Um, uh, that, that's basically uh, done by trial and error. You shoot a series of uh, photographs and do a kind of binary search to land on the right uh, parallax free region. Um, we, we ended up doing a couple dozen shots to figure that out, I think. Um, let's see, the, uh, yeah, um, digital SLRs uh, end up being a lot faster uh, for on, uh, on site work, which in the case of uh, the, build, the scanning we're doing in Columbus uh, is very important because we need to uh, drive from Athens up to Columbus, do the scans in one day, go back. Uh, we are working in areas that are in use. Uh, so um, we, we need to get in and get out as quickly as we can. So the digital filters are going to be really handy for that. Um, uh, so portability is, is great, and having more of them so we can do more work in parallel is, is great. Um, yeah, expense. Uh, the, the lens alone for the digital SLR system uh, costs about $900, and that's the largest expense uh, in, in that case. Uh, so. Um, there, there still is a pretty significant expense if you want to get a, a decent uh, spherical fish eye lens. Um, software learning curve, uh, in order to build meshes, uh, you need to be fluent with Maya and Image Modeler. Um, to stitch, you need to be fluent with Hugin and uh, remember to save frequently. Um, lack of advanced research. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is, it's a really new area, especially in uh, academia. Um, so there, there isn't many publications out there. Um, yeah, and one, one major uh, point of interest is taking uh, the image modeler aspect of this, like taking, uh, when, once you've got the spherical image uh, to automatically extract 3D meshes, or when, once you have multiple three spherical images, you can correlate those and uh, using uh, re fairly recently developed algorithms uh, demonstrated at re recent uh, SIGGRAPH uh, conferences, um, there, uh, there, are, there are some te techniques now that will automatically build 3D meshes from multiple, uh, multiple spherical scans, uh, which uh, also will greatly speed up our process. But it's yeah. going to be a couple of years, at least, till that is production ready. Yeah, and it's definitely not game friendly because. Um, no, it, it can be tuned to be game friendly, but. Yeah, it's, 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 it produces production. really high poly count images. Yep. Um, like, for example, I did like one of those kind of boomerang shaped conference phones, and I think it was like 15,000 polygons, yep. which, you know, that's death in a game. But, yep. um, uh, so um, here's our contact information if you have any questions. Um, if you'd like to see the technology um, after the presentation, please come up. Um, and uh, if you're interested in, in the software we use, the hardware and software, here's a list of um, everything. Um, 
I think the only thing we didn't show due to time was uh, Unity 3D, um, and the tripods we the tripods we use are just made by Gitzo, um, which is a Bogan brand now. Um, so, are there any questions? Uh, yes. Um, we scan everything at infinity, so the depth of field issue is not too much of an issue. Um, outside, the only real problems we run into is sometimes we can't find uh, straight edges to line up points. Um, but we have done some images um, in the parking lot, parking lot outside the grid lab, um, and there doesn't seem to be any notable issues. You, do you have anything uh, to add to that? Yeah, the, the, the exterior images so far we've, we've done have worked out well. Um, for this project in particular, we've been focusing on the inside because uh, the, uh, the project that we've been commissioned for is uh, to help first responders uh, navigate through buildings and uh, like figure out what to do in the event that nobody can see what's going on because the building is flooded with smoke or something. Um, but uh, yeah, eventually I, we're looking at possibly doing exterior modeling of the Columbus downtown area. Yeah. Um, so I mean, this technology would not be great for extracting for a, a tree mesh, for example, because yep. at this point it's just way too complex of a shape. Um, but maybe by the time this project concludes, there'll be some better technology out there for us to try. Uh, I just wondered, is six images kind of the a sweet spot you found on the cost benefit? You know, the, the more images you take, the less benefit you get? Yeah, uh, so, yeah, six images, we just basically put it at 60 degree increments, which I think is the lowest you can go on that. On, on this particular panoramic head, yes. Um, yeah, six, six is uh, what we determined to be the, uh, the optimal number. If, if we go fewer than that, then there's not enough overlap, and it's hard to find uh, points to link the two images. Uh, if we go more than that, then uh, we, we just have too much redundancy, and uh, it takes longer to shoot. Yeah, so, yeah um, and we should, we should note that that mount um, is, is it, is it Nodal Ninja brand? Is yeah, that, Nodal Ninja. Yeah, Nodal Ninja, uh, N-O-D-A-L Ninja. Um, it's um, uh, about $200, I think. Yep. So. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so the, the question is like, um, when we took the image into Image Modeler, um, was, it, was a 3D mesh uh, automatically extracted or was there like some manual work that had to go into it? Um, we have to actually, you have to line up the camera, it's similar to what Steve showed in Hugen when he was like lining up the points on the MacBook. We have to tell the computer that this pixel uh, represents the corner of this door. And we do that for every scan. Um, and then, you know, we do this for about four or five different intersecting points. Um, and then after that point, we tell the computer to go ahead and process it. And, you know, from that point on, it's completely automatic. Um, uh, often the, the depth of the mesh is sometimes off, and so that's, that's somewhat of a manual process, but that can be done in Maya. Um, it's relatively simplistic. Are there any other questions? Yes, is that, is that oh. Yeah, it, it's very similar. Um, I mean, uh, Hugen really only gets the images to the point where the pana scan got us, right? So like this one big panoramic image. Um, from there, they, they would both have to go into image modeler, um, all of the different perspectives so that we can match up the points and then extract the mesh. Do you know if the new program you use the SIFT algorithm as well? I don't know. You what? Which algorithm? Uh, I, I, I don't think uh, Image Modeler is using that algorithm, but, but uh, yeah, Hugen yeah. and it's the auto panel integration does make use of that when it works. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, image, image Modeler is a lot more manual, um, yeah, and, and it, it, it just provides a really convenient interface for uh, manually placing the control points and then auto correlating and uh, aligning the images and then allowing you to build simple 3D meshes to map the textures to. Yeah, and it, it's kind of a. I mean, it's really kind of a bastard app. I mean, they, Autodesk buys a lot of stuff, right? And they don't, they don't really, if same way from Autodesk, I apologize because I like your stuff, but um, they don't really enhance them very quickly. It takes a while for them to kind of work out all of the different bugs and um, 
They're make the features common. What's that? Putting it to Mac was a big step. Though. Yeah, right. Um, so I mean, I think image model was actually the uh, it was actually made up of, of three separate apps. Most of it being virtuals, um, but there's I mean there's some there's still some obvious issues with the software that they have to overcome. I mean, they've owned Maya and 3D Studio now for three or four years, and yet you can't work b between the two applications. So, uh. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, 